in the chat, uh, people can see that. And this is new this week, we've started to stream uh, the sessions live on YouTube as well. So um, uh, this is gonna be something we're gonna be doing in the future. So people don't have to sign in through um, Eventbrite, they can just log on on, um, on YouTube and see what's going on and listen in. Um, but I don't know how many we, how many, have we, have we done 15 of these now, Amy, about, um, I think. Yep. Um, the number of sessions is accurate on the website. I just need to tally all the recent sessions, but yeah, I think we're up to 15 or 16. Um, and um, as people are joining, um, if you can, if you have a look on the um, Open Data Save Lives website, you can see what it's all about and what we're doing next and how we, how we plan to, to take what we've been doing uh, and share that with as many people as possible so that we can make uh, an impact. Uh, today, we'll be talking about data and cases data and presenting that in useful um, ways locally. And obviously, uh, with the central belt closing, with people losing 16,000 tests down the back of the sofa, or was it 16,000 or 22,000? I can't, I can't, I couldn't work out. I think it was 16. Um, <laughs> yes, 16,000 um, um, Excel. Uh, madness. Um, so there's that. There's that. Um, but uh, we'll get into that in a bit. And, and selfishly, um, I'm looking forward today to talk with um, an expert group about what we think is useful for people to see and how that helps them make decisions because we've learned lots. And you may have seen us this week testing out some of the, uh, the ODI leads local dashboards. Um, and just saying, is this useful or not, or people using it, or how does this work? So if, if you've got any comments, um, either put it in the Google Doc that is in the, um, um, on the web page, or just uh, say in the chat, you know, we, this is a useful geography. At this, at this scale, people make a decision, or uh, we'd love to see this data against that data. Um, so... Um, that's it. So it's, it's exactly 11 o'clock now. So usually what happens is we, people join in the first three minutes and um, as always with these things, the jeopardy is, is, is anyone going to turn up? And we've got a few people already. And what I quite like about them currently working is that um, people turn up on time for video calls now. Um, that there's, there's this, um, no one has the uh, the first five minutes of the fumbling around trying to get it to work then 15 minutes and can you send me the link and um, everyone now is expected to be able to work a zoom link or, or a, uh, a youtube link although webex and skype man alive why are people still using webex and skype it's like um, yeah. so we've still got people joining the the room uh, we've got two of us two of our speakers online so that that's good so what, what i'm going to do is um uh, Leslie Ann Kelly is going to talk first, if that's okay with you, Leslie. Um, and is it Leslie Ann or Leslie? And what do you prefer? Leslie Ann. My well, dad's called so Leslie. Leslie Ann, we'll so, get that right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so Leslie Ann. Um, uh, Stuart Lowe from ODI Leeds is going to talk about um, building a useful dashboard. Um, and that's quite interesting because there's um, a lot of talk about dashboards, but we want to actually build a useful one. Hi, Jenny's just joined us, which, which is great. Hi, Jenny. Um, you'd have to speak, it's okay. <laughs> um, and Jenny's going to talk about her work with Cases Data. And if you, um, Jenny put up a really nice um, uh, sort of R stroke blog, um, R stats um, uh, uh, package online saying looking at the data and, and what's useful or not. And, and I know that Stuart found that very useful in, in making um, some of his data online. So we're going to have three talks um, all about um, cases data, presenting that data, trying to make sense of it. Um, and selfishly, from ODI Lee's perspective, we love people to share with us um, their thoughts about what is a useful dashboard or what, is, what's, what constitutes useful information we can share so that um, we can continue to develop our dashboard, but also share everything that we find so that other people um, can use that uh, as well in the work that they're doing because um, no doubt over the next uh, two or three weeks there is going to be a lot of interest around um, 
data, local data for local people, I guess, is going to be the, um, the conversation. And what does it mean? And, and how, you know, can I go out? Can I not go out? Can I meet my friends? Can I go for a walk? Um, should I go to the pub? Should I not? Um, and uh, our our uh, role all, all the way through Open Data Saves Lives has been trying to get people talking about data in a useful way. And then also because of the way ODL is set up with our sponsors, we do have a direct line into the people at NHS England, NHS Digital um, and NHSX who are working on this. So we do have a way of um, influencing people um, in a soft way and in a friendly way. So the friendly and helpful way. So we're, I think the way of uh, moaning and shouting is probably not gonna get us very far, but um, helping people to understand what might be useful. And if we tweak things in a different way, then I'd be able to use it um, separately. So we're at 11.04 um, and I'd like to start because I would like to finish uh, before 12 o'clock. And um, I'm now gonna introduce the whole um, uh, open data science science session for, for today. So today's session was set up about three weeks ago. We wanted to talk about Casey's data and we wanted to talk about dashboards and how to make um, the, the available data useful. Um, it would appear that our timing is perfect um, as um, it would have um, somebody lost 16,000 um, uh, Casey's data down the back of the sofa, but they were found again. Um, Scotland's um, instituting um, additional measures this morning and as of Monday who knows what's going to be happening um, in, in England and, and one of the things we also wanted to do was um, have a different perspective from um, somewhere else in uh, in the UK so I'm really happy that Leslie Ann from um, Scotland is going to talk about what she's been doing with data up there and how, to, how she's been presenting it and also she comes from a journalist background and, and there's, a, there's a slightly different um, context in how they're presenting the, the data. Um, Stuart Lowe from ODI Leeds has been uh, looking and exploring his dashboard to try and find out what is useful and how people find that useful and you know what comparing places is that a good thing or do you want just your own place or do people want to understand the geography uh, and Jenny Tennyson from ODI HQ has been looking at the cases data and what does it actually mean and, and um, we're going to have uh, Jenny's going to share with us the work she's been doing and and at the end, if you've got any questions, we'll pick them up in the chat um, and get people to do that. And then as ODI leads, we're going to record this as part of um, Open Data Saves Lives with uh, beautiful information. And then try and create something that we can feed back as a group um, to whomever. We'll just put it on the web and they can access it. Um, but hopefully there'll be some useful points that, that people can take. So first up, uh, Leslie Ann from Scotland. If you could just tell us, um, I won't do that for you. You can tell us who you are, where you're from, and, and also share some of the stuff you've been doing with our data. Yep, I'll just share my screen just now. I've got a small presentation for you. I won't bore you too much, just on um, where we've been in terms of open data in Scotland. So, first of all, that's my name. I'm Leslie Ann Kelly, and it's Leslie Ann, because as I said, my dad's name is Leslie Kelly, so it always it gives you that little chill down your spine whenever someone says, <laughs> says Leslie. Um, that's me on Twitter, where you can find me quite often complaining about bad government data visualisation. I'm the data editor at DCT Media. I work mainly with the Courier and the Press and Journal newspapers, so we our circulation is kind of anywhere above the central belt in Scotland. Um, kind of above Stirling, anywhere above there, Dundee, Angus, Perthshire, the Highlands and Islands, all that kind of area. That's where we cover. Um, however, for the COVID data, I've been covering all of Scotland just because there's no point pulling out little bits of data from it. I may as well be presenting the whole picture. I have very strong opinions on pie charts, particularly bad pie charts. Um, and I can also be found on the Stushy podcast, which is in here so that my podcast producer doesn't show at me. Um, so yes, bad pie charts. So just very briefly, in the beginning of the COVID situation, I started tracking the what was happening in around February. So the very first COVID data set that I put together and visualised was scraped from the Scottish Government Twitter account. When we first started, kind of Every, at 2 p.m. in February every day, the Scottish Government Twitter account would tweet out how many people had been tested. This was before we even had a positive case 
but that was still interesting data to see the amount of people that were coming forward and needed tested it was still a, a useful metric for people to look at and people were interested in but it wasn't anywhere the only place you could get it was if you were pulling it from the scottish government um twitter account so that's obviously not great and then in much of march and april the only covid data in scotland was an html table on the scottish government site with snapshot data so every day at two o'clock they would update this data with here are today's figures and only if you were taking pools of that data did you get any time series data it was very fragile because there were essentially government comms officers in the back end of wordpress updating the the data manually every day so it was very open to human error there were things that would throw up issues if like for example if they threw in a, a, a some days they used thousand separators, some days they didn't. So if you had any kind of script set up to pull from that, it would it would mess with them. It was it was just very fragile data. It wasn't great. And it took a, what felt like a lot of teeth pulling to start getting that time series data in a usable format and to start getting little dribbles of more data um, out there in the public. Now though, we do have quite a lot of data, but in my opinion, it's quite scattered around the place and that's it's not great for the people that actually need the data so that's one of the things I'm quite passionate about is taking all of this data and putting it together in a way that people can actually use and like you say make decisions from and in their day-to-day -day lives for example data on cases it, the Scottish government site now publish two spreadsheets every day at two o'clock one just with Scottish data one with data broken down by health board there is a public health Scotland dashboard there is some open data on statistics.gov.scot and there's also an NHS Scotland open data site. One of the issues with this is, there, I can't think of any logical reason for it, but the Scottish Government site publish health board area data, which some of the health boards in Scotland are absolutely massive. The Highlands, for example, is the biggest health board, I think, in the country in the terms of the actual footprint it covers. So it's not particularly useful data for someone living in a small area of the Highlands but it's the Scottish Government data is the most high profile. The statistics.gov.scot and the NHS Scotland Open Data Site are very, not many people seem to know about them. So whenever I, that's the only place you can get lower level geography data. So for example, local authority data. And whenever I publish that, I, I generally tend to get people thinking I'm some kind of a wizard and wondering where I've got it from because it's not out there in a very publicly accessible way and both the statistics.gov.scot and the NHS Scotland Open Data site are not very user friendly at a glance so yeah we, there's lots of data scattered. Death data is even more scattered so that it's published in the same places as the case data however once a month the NRS put out a big report on all of their findings it's a bit like the ONS report which is still weekly the NRS report used to be weekly, but they started dipping down to a much lower level and they moved to monthly. Then I imagine that might change at some point soon. And then in the weeks that the NRS doesn't publish that data, it's on what's called the Four Harms dashboard, which it, it just kind of moved there one day. It wasn't very well publicised. And I find that half of my job is becoming a bit of an investigator to find all of this data and piece it together for people. And I think without kind of, not to blow my own horn, but without people like us that are putting together these dashboards or these collections of data, it would be very difficult for your average person out there to, to look at the data and make informed choices on, on how they live their lives. And I think that we've essentially filled a gap that the government should be filling. That all of the, one of the issues I have with the dashboards that have been published so far is that there doesn't seem to be very much of a, a mobile first type of design and a lot of these dashboards are they're like tableau dashboards or things like that and they don't work very well on mobiles which is something that as a data journalist working for a newspaper I design everything mobile first because that is 70% of how people come to our site so it's it's a very important way that you need to get the point across so I'm going to move to I'll stop sharing just a second so I can reshare with the right I'll show you what I've done with the data briefly. So if I go to Google, I just thought I'll pull up the actual site. Um, just so, rather, so you can actually see what it is. So if I go to the courier, the 
This is where you can find all of the data I've pulled together. It's on the Courier, it's on the Press and Journal, I think it's on the Evening Titles as well. But I'm based in Dundee, so the Courier is kind of my home brand. Um, so if you click on this Coronavirus tab, and then it's always pinned here in the Coronavirus tab. A few times we have accidentally removed it and I immediately get emails of complaint from people. So I will slowly scroll down to give it a little bit of time to load because there is an awful lot of data here. But this date here is there mainly as a, a sign of that is the last time probably I didn't have, I could leave the house at 2 p.m. because now every day I'm kind of tied to my desk because a lot of this open data is, is great and you can run scripts and um, automate a lot of stuff, but there are issues at least once a week. So you have to kind of check that things are working. And I don't want that publicly out on the site if it's inaccurate data. So every day I'm having to check things are are fine. So this is probably the most automated that I've got. Um, this is I put this right at the top because as I said, I find that people are really interested in data on their local authority area rather than their health board area. So this is a very quick snapshot of new cases in the last 24 hours and the uh, case rate over the last seven days. Um, and I find that people really like this format because it's just it's very quick and dirty and um, people can go and see their local authority and see how it's, it's done in the last day um, in terms of other things we have which are all pulled from either the scottish government site or the um nhs open data site and um, i tend not to use the statistics.gov.scot site just because i find it very frustrating <laughs> um but yeah daily testing data so we have the nhs lab so that's pillar one and then the uk gov labs pillar two um, this was a very recent addition. This was added on Monday or Tuesday, and I have been begging for this data for months now. So it was a very welcome addition. It was added onto the NHS Open Data site, which is the same as the above, just testing Pillar One and Pillar Two, but by area. Unfortunately, there, I've asked, and there's no plans to publish this by local authority. Um, but it's it's better than than the nothing we had before because one of the questions I would get quite often when there were for example the Grand Pain outbreak or we had the Cooper Angus outbreak is is it just that we're testing more and I didn't know because there was no local testing data available so that's great. Our daily case chart I will say everything on this page has changed since it was published on March I don't think there is a single chart that has remained that they've all been upgraded or changed and that is one of the 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 troubles is kind of moving with the times of what is the kind of key metric this week. I find that it's, it's changed a lot. We've gone from just being interested in cases and then it was excess deaths and percentage positivity is now a big factor. Our number, you know, it's, it's kind of, you have to move with whatever people are really interested in or whatever the government is saying is the key metric at the time. So this is the case positivity. I've highlighted that line where the WHO says that we should essentially not be out of lockdown if we're above it. And as you can see, we're doing fantastic. Um, this was something I added fairly recently as well when there was the more publicised university outbreaks um, talking about the kind of clusters in the 15 to 19 age group. You can see in um, the first wave they were very very unaffected by the virus and a lot of that was probably due to we weren't testing them because they weren't presenting in hospital and in the first wave we weren't we were really only testing people that were very sick but it shows that cluster becoming an issue when universities reopened and what it also shows for me is that cluster kind of dripping downwards it's the kind of what I call the taking it home to granny effect so it's you can kind of see that effect in this heat map and I also I, I've been I don't know if you follow Colin Angus on Twitter he does some lovely stream graphs of the age ranges so I popped that in as well. I, I imagine it's probably something that a lot of people find difficult to read, which is why I think the heat map is there as well, just to balance it out. One of my things is, like I said, I'm very passionate about making these things in a way that people can easily understand. And sometimes I do things purely for my pleasure of creativity, but I always try to match that up with something that's a bit easier. Um, this is just kind of our case, like line chart. Um, this is quite a recent addition as well. So it's by local authority, as I said, people find that more informative and you can flick between the cases that are new today per 100,000 or your total cases. Um, how has it spread in each health board? So again, it's pretty much on the rise everywhere in Scotland right now and the Western Isles is it's pretty concerning. This is just, again, I always try and put a few different ways of visualising the same data because people 
understand things in different ways. This is just the same data visualised in a different way with the daily new cases um, and unfortunately the deaths. This is one of the things that was very difficult early on was when you guys all have had the same thing down south with the difference between the DHSC data and the ONS data of the different death definitions and people being very confused over that and that was a, an issue that we had early on. So the the kind of dark blue line is the confirmed death. So that's the people who've died within 28 days of a positive test. Um, and the kind of teal line is the NRS data. So that's where the death has been noted as a contributory factor on the death certificate and people get very confused over this. So that's why I think it's important to have it in the same chart and have the kind of definitions in there so that people can try and get their head around it. They're, they're different measures. Um, and they're both helpful in their own way. Um, deaths by fatality, um, deaths by health board, and we've also got it by local authority. This doesn't get updated as much nowadays because we don't get that data as often. The NRS publish this data and it's only once a month now. This is an interesting one. This is the lowest level of geography that we've had available in Scotland. I understand that you guys have had MSOA data for a bit longer than we have, and this is kind of the equivalent of that. Um, it's called intermediate zones in Scotland. The only data that's been published on this is deaths by intermediate zone published by the NRS and it only gets published again once a month, if that. Um, there is recently been published on the Public Health Scotland Tableau dashboard, they've published cases by intermediate zone, which is great, but from what I hear online, nobody uses that dashboard because it's very cumbersome. And as I said, <laughs> doesn't work well, doesn't play well with mobile and people just, they find it difficult to navigate. So I have spoken to Public Health Scotland and they are, they've told me getting their hands on some of the data to publish on the open data site. So as soon as I have more data at that level, it will be on here as well. Um, some data on age ranges. The further you go down the site, it, it's probably the less updated data. It's probably more the monthly updated data. Try and kind of have the daily updated figures closer to the top because that's what people are interested in. So this is um, deaths by population density of the health boards in Scotland. Um, and this is, this is an important one that I should probably push further up the site just now because it's become more recently important is hospitalizations and intensive care. And you can see one of the issues with this was on the 11th of September, the Scottish government changed the definition. I don't know, there was a bit of a, a stushy with um, Carl Hennigan published from the Centre of Evidence-Based Medicine, criticising the Scottish and Welsh governments and said that they were overcounting the way that they categorised um, COVID hospitalisations and there was a bit of substance to it. So the government went away and recategorised. Essentially back here, it was anybody who was in hospital who'd had a positive COVID test and they may no longer be treated for COVID. They were still categorised as a, a COVID hospitalisation. And later on, that, that became a bit problematic because the definition apparently, I didn't realise this until the change, I don't think they said this until they changed it, but one of the issues was that someone could go into hospital with COVID, come out a week later, be out of hospital for a week, get hit by a bus. <laughs> it's always the example of being hit by a bus. I mean, how many people are hit by a bus? But that's what we always say when we're talking about these things. Get hit by a bus, be back in hospital, and they would be re-added to the COVID hospitalisations count because they'd had a COVID test in the last 28 days. So that, that wasn't great. The number from here with this line is the new methodology where it's just people being treated for COVID in hospital. There is still a 28 days factor on that. And we know from experience that there are people who have been in hospital for a lot longer. So even this new methodology is problematic, but it's been rising sharply again in the last few days. It's been, yeah, it's not great. And these are weekly death figures of um, where the deaths have happened. And you can just about see that there's been an uptick, uptick in the deaths in the last last few weeks. I have one chart on cases by cases and deaths by deprivation because um, there's not a whole lot of data on that. Um, I know bar chart races are a bit, there's a, a lot of people don't like them, particularly for COVID data, but I this seemed to do well. Um, people seem to like this on social media for showing when the COVID had fallen back down the ranks of the leading causes of death in Scotland. So it's quite a good visualization for that. The R number, which again, has not been doing great. And then this is the only bit where I dive into any 
ONS data. So I weekly I do pull the ONS and NISRA data on the excess deaths just to just to put this chart together to to show how we're doing with the rest of the country. And I do daily pull from the data.coronavirus.gov um, just to put the cases into context with yes we're we're doing badly but the peaks are at the same time everywhere it's it's a uk wide wide spread and this is the last chart i've got which is weekly confirmed and suspected deaths per million population it was just something someone had requested and i must have been feeling charitable that day so <laughs> i had it onto the site so yeah feel free to go away and have a look at the site and give me any feedback you have if there's anything you think i'm missing a trick on or anything that you find helpful or unhelpful. Um, I think the site's actually loaded quite well today. It can be pretty slow because there's a lot of stuff on here. Technically, this is all done within Flourish, which I don't know if you've heard of. It's a, a data visualization tool. They are very good in newsrooms. The, one of the co-founders was a Guardian journalist, I believe. Um, and so they have a passion for journalism. And as part of the Google News Initiative, they have funded, they give, it's not a a pro account per se, but they give extra enhanced accounts to newsrooms for free, which is absolutely great. So everything that's on the site is we've, we've been able to do for free, which is, is great. Most of it, or as much of it as possible, pulls from the open data. I find I have to kind of run a lot of things via a Google Sheet, which is frustrating to do some extra calculations or to kind of do things like in the, when this data was first published, they didn't publish the actual area names. It was the area codes. So I then had to kind of run that through an intermediary to, to match up the codes with the names, because if I just published that with codes, people don't have a clue what that means. But yeah, as much as possible is automated. But as I said, not a day has gone by since the 18th of March that I haven't had to look at the COVID data and check that everything is running appropriately and as it should. It's it's become my life now. I have said to the people at Public Health Scotland that I hope they are putting some funds away to fund all of the post-traumatic stress that all of the people who've been visualising COVID since March, when it, when this is all hopefully over, when it comes to two o'clock and we start getting the, the palpitations of, oh God, I've got to go check the stats. So hopefully one day I won't be, won't be checking all the COVID yeah. stats at 2pm every day, but for now, that's my life. That's amazing, Lizanne, and I, I'm... Um... A round of applause here from, from ODI Leagues and, and um, what, I, what I do like about that is that you've thought about what is useful for people rather than um, what can we publish and um, a, 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 the, the, the control um, um, freakery and the dashboard wars that I know are happening um, in, uh, in the NHS about who controls the dashboard rather than who helps the data be uh, published um, usefully so other people can do it. So that, that's amazing. Um, some great um, uh, feedback in the chat there about the, the work. And we do know that um, Flourish does include the ODI Leads hex maps. Um, it does, uh, yes. As a standard. So um, uh, we do we do like Flourish here and, and those standards. So um, uh, I think uh, that'd be lovely. And, we, and we'd, um, uh, we'd love to stay in touch with you about what we're doing. And obviously, um, there is going to be more of this over the next um, uh, three to six months. I think we're maybe at half time, maybe not quite at half time, but that, that's amazing. So, if, is there any questions for Lesian before we move on? Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much. Um, and we're now going to um, uh, have a chat with uh, Stuart Lowe from ODI Leads, who's been experimenting with uh, dashboards um, down here, um, similarly to try and make create create useful stuff for people to to use. And then Jenny's going to join us at the end and, and give us a review of where, where we are with data and, and her work that she's been doing. So over to you, Stuart. All right, let me try sharing that. So um, people who've been to these before know that we were doing a West Yorkshire dashboard. I've moved it um, now and it's going to be not just the West Yorkshire dashboard um, because we had people from Stockport asking about Greater Manchester and I'm sure other people in other parts of the country want their local authorities. So. We started this back in March and like Leslie Ann, this has changed multiple times across the year as things have gone, gone on. So we've tried to have a local authority focus, which limits what you can show because not everything's published by local authority. So can I advance my slide? Yes, I can. So this is what it looks like at the moment. If you were to go to that link, I'm sure someone from Adiales can put the link in the chat. Um, I'm using now color coding that came from 
Jenny Tennyson at IDIHQ. Um, she'll talk about that, I'm sure, in the next talk. And that comes from California, although everywhere's purple now, so maybe we, we have a different way of color coding it. Um, it's it's rejigged around um, this dashboard, as various people have said they prefer various things in different orders. So at the moment, the daily cases per 100,000 is a graph at the top. I'm generating those um, from the PHE um, API. I'm not doing it live anymore because I realized sometimes that API has gone down. I decided I also wanted to keep a record of their, their data with time. So I'm now copying the local authority output for every local authority uh, into a GitHub repository and saving it. So the Git um, history is there as well. Um, and then I'm generating static SVGs um, for people who like that sort of thing. If you want uh, an SVG for your local authority updated daily, then there's a URL for that. Um, anyway, we've, I've then added in restrictions that comes from, um, let me move on to the next slide. In fact. So populations come from ONS estimates for England and there was a Dropbox file for other parts of the UK that I was using. Um, cases comes from the Public Health England API, deaths from ONS weekly death data, because unfortunately the PHE API doesn't have deaths by local authority, at least it didn't last time I checked. Um, and restrictions I'm now adding in from the House of Commons library um, create a CSV file. They also create a very nice map. Um, so there's the PHE API, that's the ONS daily death data, um, weekly death data. Um, each file gets bigger and bigger with time because I just put all the deaths in start in um, noted by week. Um, and that's, that's the House of Commons coronav coronavirus restrictions map, which is quite nice and um, showing you your local restrictions. And in the show more link at the top there, um, there's a CSV file that you can download, which is what I'm using. It, I'm not sure if they've updated it with the central belt of Scotland restrictions. Um, anyway, this is the GitHub repo. Um, so there's a data directory where I'm storing JSON files that I'm making for each local authority now. That's good, driving the dashboard. So I'm trying to bring in those different sources and put them into one place as JSON. I mean, hopefully it's vaguely human readable um, for those who, who aren't techie and codey. Um, but you can see it's sp split into sections for restrictions, deaths and cases. And then I've put the case data. Now the cases are using the specimen date because that's all that's provided by local authority from PHE. Um, but it's probably the best thing to use anyway. Um, and then, as I said, because it's on Git, there's a, a, a commit history so you can see what's changed. So yesterday, this was the update yesterday, you can see how many days um, of data they've, they've modified. And not all of those, so the red ones are things that have been, have been removed and the green ones have been things that have been put in. And if you look at the dates, you can see not every day has had a change. Um, but you can see they've gone back to the 21st of September to add in or take out, in some cases, um, case case numbers. Let me switch to sharing, sharing my browser. Is that that one? Yes. Um, so yeah, as I said, there's the, there's the GitHub repo. If I go to the dashboard, by default, it shows West Yorkshire because that's where we are. Um, but you can customize it if you can see the URL there. If you put the local authority codes, and I realize that's not helpful for people, but you can construct the link um, and then just use that link in the future. So if you put in a local authority codes, it will create your custom local authority dashboard. So here I've just done the, the way at South Wales coast from Swansea to Newport along the coast there. So you can see them. And if I just scroll down, so they're the, the case numbers, the dotted lines, so the dashed lines that are horizontal are the, the different levels that are up at the top here. Minimal, moderate, substantial and widespread. Um, I think Vale of Glamorgan was the only one that wasn't purple yesterday, but it's now gone to purple today. And um, there's the restrictions. It doesn't cope with Lanethley because that's not a local authority, but everywhere else in the country is done by local authority. So that's fine. Um, and then we've got total cases per 100,000, the weekly cases, what change that is on the previous week, um, the weekly cases per 100,000, the weekly deaths, um, as of week 39 there from the ONS, the total COVID-19 deaths, and then the total of all deaths, um, and then just the sort of ratio of those two to find the percentage of COVID-19 related deaths compared to all deaths, because um, that can vary as well. And then just at the bottom, so that people know what population numbers I'm using for the 100,000s, 
there at the bottom. If people have different ideas about um, population estimates, I was using the 2020 ones from ONS, um, but they were England and I think Wales, and so other parts may vary of the UK. Um, and there's it, so there's Scottish major cities um, with big populations. Now, unfortunately, because I'm using the ONS deaths, obviously these figures are all empty at the bottom, um, which is a shame. But I'm trying to pull in data from several different sources. And as Leslie Ann said, it's difficult keeping on top of things, especially when things break and people um, don't have the right data for some reason and then things disappear. All right, I think that's me. Amazing. Thanks very much, Stuart. And um, that the we always think at ODILEs is the best way to understand the data is try and use it. And, and part of our um, objective here is, is we're trying to understand what's going on with the data. Therefore, we try to build a dashboard. And then we thought that it would work great at uh, West Yorkshire level, which it, which it did. And I know Hannah's online where she she um, she works in one part of West Yorkshire. Uh, kids go to school in another, and then um, she um, she works in another, and that, that really helps compare. Um, but then, actually, if you talk to Greater Manchester, West Yorkshire works really well because there's five local authorities. Greater Manchester's ten, so that doesn't really work well on, on mobile. Each of those dashboards work um, singly uh, really well as a, a mobile first um, application. So we're, we're trying to just explore the data, use the data, and then, and then maybe help others who might want to build something more formal or if, uh, the, this, this, we can give them advice about how to do that. Um, and also um, that's the best way to use the, uh, to find out what it really means is to try and build something to, uh, with it. So uh, we're going to continue with that, that if you've got it. Sorry, I was just going to say, I should on. probably add that for the, the daily cases figure, I'm using the seven day rolling smoothed average from five days ago. And the reason for not using the last five days um, or a number from yesterday is, as Jenny T pointed out, um, there's a lot of underreporting that seems to go back about five days. So we're using the figure from five days ago because that's the most reliable. I should have just yeah. added that before. Yeah, and I, th and I think that, that we, we worked that out by looking at what Jenny's done and then looking at the data and then said, okay, right, five days ago is probably the most reliable. But then people then look at the uh, PHE dashboard and they look at actually well it's it says zero on the on the data but it says 82 on the on the on the on the website so which one's right and then there's there's all this confusion which is unnecessary I think and there's it's quite simple for um, we've we've played around with it I think we've got a simple way of communicating that so there's something that we all need to try and help people understand the data and, and um, get rid of a lot of this confusion because it uh, the confusion's um, not helping. I would say. So it's really great work. Um, I, yeah, that, that Hannah just said, could we do a Northern Cities um, uh, uh, one? Well, yeah, I think we can now. And we can do individual cities. We can put that URL somewhere else that it could be hosted alongside something else. So, you know, um, um, and people in Liverpool don't have to be told in the sun that they're going to have a lockdown um, uh, uh, on Monday. They, they maybe get it from actual data presented by some of their elected um, representatives who might have a little bit more trust. Um, who 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 default it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you if you want to uh, get in touch with us, if you want to share the stuff, it's all open. All the codes open. Uh, we'd love other people to join in. So um, please do um, let us know. And we are finding out a lot more about the data by using it. And we'll we'll we will be writing this up and then. Um, sending it on to the um, uh, uh, the open data team at NHS Digital and NHSX so they can uh, get some of our feedback. Um, so that's great. Okay, so if there's, if there's any specific questions for Stuart, just put them at the end in the chat and we'll pick it over the end. And now I'd like to ask uh, Jenny Tennyson uh, from ODI HQ, uh, just to give us a view about some of the work she's been doing around trying to understand the cases data and, um, and, and where do we go from here? So over to you, Jenny, welcome. Uh, thanks very much. Excuse me a second while I just get my screens all sorted out. Um, uh, right, so I'm going to, uh, hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to just talk about some of the stuff that I've been up to uh, and what I learned from it. Um, uh, so if, uh, if you haven't seen it, 
basically I've got just a, a static HTML page or, or rather it updates when I update it um, that just looks at COVID-19 cases in England. Um, there's a bit of just exploration, description of what the data does. Um, and then it digs into particular areas where there have been restrictions, where there are current restrictions and also tries to identify places uh, just from the data where probably we should be a bit worried and probably there should be restrictions or, or we could um, anticipate there might be upcoming restrictions. Um, and then also generate graphs and stuff for any areas of interest. So ones that are in the news and I just currently have a running thing on, on London because people are worried about London even. Um, well, there are lots of other places they should be more worried about. And the graphs themselves look something like this. Um, as Stuart said, using the, the colour scheme, I'll come on to that, that bit later, that gives it a nice sunset feel, uh, I, I think, over, over cliffs. Um, this, uh, this example also, just to demonstrate that it's got, um, it, it uh, highlights um, the times when there are lockdowns. And I use this example because it shows places going into lockdown, coming out of lockdown, going into lockdown again. Um, so with those kind of white, white areas to illustrate when those lockdowns happen and also this thing about how do we communicate with people that some of these numbers are, are underestimates so so i've got over on the on the right the kind of this this stuff is underestimates the stuff on the on the very right hand side is underestimates and we can't really tell how much and i'll come on to that in a bit so uh some lessons uh um numbering from zero because i'm a programmer and that gives me a maximum number of five uh you'll see later. Uh, so this is all done in R Markdown kind of for fun because um, uh, this is my first R Markdown stuff and I wanted to learn it and the best way of learning is by doing uh, and it's kind of neat and uh, so recommend it if you if you want to try out doing some doing some R. R Markdown basically inter interpolates the analyses that you do in the R uh, that you do uh, amongst your normal Markdown and generates HTML pages off the back of it. It's quite cool. Um, first thing I wanted to draw out was this thing about APIs versus static files. So the, the pages that I generate are based on the static file that is, is created every day that is a that contains all the data on cases in England at local authority level, but also at, at higher levels. Uh, so it also creates, uh, it contains nation level stuff. Um, and I'm using that rather than the APIs that are available. Um, because you can get the whole thing in one lump and that was what was available when I was uh, first doing it in July um, and I haven't had time to adapt to the APIs themselves um, but I also thought it was just interesting this that time series data at local authority level is an obvious thing that lots of people who are doing these visualizations might want to get hold of creating them as static files means that if there's a lot less load on the API um, uh, which would alleviate some of the problems that Stuart was talking about about it going down all the time so complementing APIs with static files for you know standard downloads I think is a it would be a good idea it's a good idea um, second thing to talk about, we've already touched on it, missing data. So um, when I first started, uh, so as I said, then I've got this kind of underestimates thing at the, at the end because the, um, we know that reporting delays mean that you don't get the, the right numbers of cases, the accurate numbers of cases for a few days. Um, um, oh, sorry, I was, yeah, for, the, and for the lockdown areas, um, then Sorry, that's the, that's the next point. The, the lockdown areas, I, there wasn't anything about where lockdowns were or when they came into place. So basically I created a, a Google spreadsheet that contained that information that was good enough for me and for my analysis that basically it has like one row per um, announcement of a change in roughly, uh, of a change in lockdown state. Um, you can see during the early stages, there were lots of announcements on GovUK of uh, lockdowns that then only that then only came into legislation like six days later, for example. So this kind of data highlights how the government decision making about uh, lockdowns were communicated differently on GovUK to 
legislation.gov.uk and there's been lots of there's been lots of conversation recently on twitter about how to get data about those local lockdowns and where they are and what's actually involved in local lockdowns and it's all a bit of a mess because it's not really um, structured as, you, as uh, the, the lockdowns themselves aren't really structured right there isn't a formal way of, of describing those lockdowns there are various places where you can now go and get um, data about those lockdowns this is the summary of them from Matthew Somerville from Dakos who, who has done an API that gives you at a postcode level what the lo lockdown looks like right now um, and gives kind of highlights of the the good things and bad things about the, the different kinds of ones that are available. Um, I haven't looked into whether they do the kind of timeline version that, that I need for the visualizations I'm creating but um, that for understanding lockdown rules now then these are the places to go. Third thing was about uncertain data which is that stuff about what happens at the end so um, there there is a period of time but it like basically July where you can uh, get hold of data that um, easily ish for, from a on a day-to-day -day basis that can tell you that you can use in order to see what the reporting delays look like in normal circumstances and based on an analysis of that so I looked at how long it takes to to get to the the final value and you can see for example with Blackburn on Darwin on a one particular day then it takes about it took about six days for it to get to the final value um, the graph on the on the bottom right shows how that kind of changes over time basically on day zero or day one um, then everybody reports zero cases and they might end up having 80 um, but you can't tell what that's going to look like from that data so uh, using data from about five days ago is it gives you a, uh, um, a, a moderately solid estimate of what is what it's eventually going to turn out to actually be the the real figure uh, that was all before um, all of the stuff that hit the news recently about the lost test results, which of course also adjust those figures um, and mean that the, the previous figures were over a, quite a long period of time, as Stuart highlighted, were, were wrong. Um, but we ought to also be treating any of these numbers with a pinch of salt, obviously, because it all depends, uh, case data all depends on the availability of testing and uh, two weeks ago or, or um, three weeks ago then that was the thing that everybody was worried about lack of testing and and uh, which would obviously then have an impact on the numbers um, I've got a bit of my uh, analysis that looks at that testing data and looks at whether in order to try and understand when we shouldn't be trusting those case numbers and um, you can see the top left there looks at it over the entire course of the of the epidemic and uh, the basically at the beginning of the epidemic then the the number of um, tests that were going on by case was such that you really couldn't trust that that data there was uh, about a third of the um, tests would turn into a case which means that you're not testing enough um, then it became fairly good and in particular a part of part of the reason that it looks like that is because we didn't have data actually about how much commercial testing was going on um, and so uh, since mid July then that's looked better so if you look on the top right then that's the picture of the what's happened since July and you can see recently then that again that percentage has been creeping up which implies that there aren't enough um, that, that there's uh, there's some strain on the testing capacity and then the bottom um, graph looks at testing capacity reported testing capacity versus reported numbers of tests um, which you can see hit a, a peak of uh, um, draw on capacity around mid-September of about 95 percent but has dropped down since then None of that is actually really helpful when you're looking at local authority level, though, because uh, testing capacity at different local authorities might be different. And so um, the, it, it, I find it very hard to know how much to take that testing data and really apply it to, to how much to agree with or not agree with the, the kind of or, or put some fuzziness around the kind of case figures that were coming through. Um, but it's an interesting thing to look at. Um, 
Fourth thing I want to talk about standards. So um, as I said, the, the colour scheme is um, one that I've adopted from elsewhere, specifically the uh, stuff that um, California came out with around identifying what kind of levels you need to be worried about. And that's what Stuart has, has also adopted. And we've been having some conversations now that the level is, is so much more than seven in lots of different places, what to now call these extra levels. And also, obviously, we have to decide what colour to use them as well. Um, uh, there is, uh, I saw going around today, this other stuff that was a proposal from um, Institute for Government, I think, around um, different ways in which you could label that. If you look at it, actually, that level four, 50 to 1,000, is a huge span that is actually the same as widespread in our, uh, in the way in which we're classifying it. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't modify really the, the problem of having undifferentiated kind of um, things. But it's interesting to see this, kind of what's the, the emerging standardization of how we talk about these kinds of figures. And then the fifth point that I just wanted to make was around decision making. So um, part of the point with the analysis that I was doing was how can we help local authorities to understand what their what the picture looks like in their area? Um, how can we help their decisions decisions to be made about whether there should be some local lockdowns? Um, and currently, this is from today, so there are 204 areas in the UK, in the England rather, where there's widespread infection and 154 of them aren't in lockdown. Um, that number has been going up every single, every single day, including the ones that aren't currently in lockdown. And when you look at the graphs and look at the, the kind of um, prevalence of COVID-19 in these particular areas, it's very hard to see the rationale behind why some areas would be in lockdown and others aren't in lockdown. So on the right, Manchester has been in lockdown since the beginning of August. It went into lockdown when the level of infection was substantial um, and uh, cases have continued to rise. Um, but in Nottingham, then, uh, despite being at that same see, being at the same level as Manchester was when it went into lockdown in early September, nothing's been done. There's no there's no um, there's no local lockdown in place, and so that kind of calls into question: What is it that the government is using to make decisions, or government and local authorities are using to make decisions about local lockdowns? Um, and I should say that I don't think it should be data driven based on cases. I'm sure that there's there's lots of other information that is used to make those decisions at the local level. And to give an example of why that's important, have a look at Northampton, where in mid August, there's this huge spike. And the reason for that huge spike is lots of testing at Green Core factories where they had a big outbreak. Um, and uh, if you were doing a kind of purely data driven approach, then you would have locked down Northampton entirely at that point. But actually, it was a very localised um, thing that they, that they addressed through local action at that level. So I think we have to be careful about being completely data driven, recognise that this is one set of, of information that leads into that, uh, into those decisions being made. But on the other hand, it would be it would help to understand what the other factors are that is going into making decisions about um, lockdown at the local level. Um, so those are all the points that I that I thought might be useful. The um, the uh, analysis itself is at that um, GitHub.io uh, URL, and the um, the code for it is all at uh, is all on GitHub as well. If anybody wants to pick it up, figure. It out. Uh, play around with it, improve it because, like I say, it's my first R. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Jenny. And, and just before we um, uh, go, can we just go give um, uh, Stuart a virtual round of applause as well? Because that, that, that's great stuff. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, amazing, amazing work. And I think um, uh, the question I ask for, I guess, Stuart, Leslie, Ann, and yourself um, has anyone from uh, PHE? Uh, Public Health England, NHS Digital, NHS X, been in touch with you to sort of um, ask for your um, advice or support around that? No? Um, <laughs> um, 
Um, because we, we had the, um, uh, what, what we're trying to do is make sure that we can, um, uh, yeah, we've got um, NHS Digital on the call. Fantastic. Okay. Is Alistair, um, is Alistair on the call as well? Uh, no. Fab. So um, I guess the, um, the offer is, is uh, NHS Digital and NHS X are sponsors of, of ODI Leads. Um, we would love to share this with you. And, and my, my point I said earlier in the chat is that maybe the users of the data could be used as your designers of your APIs um, and what could be um, built um, rather than um, uh, at, at an earlier stage. So people are already using your data could be the people that um, help you design the, the data APIs and, and, um, and how we are presenting the data. And we, and we probably don't need any dashboards from NHS Digital or NHS X. I, would controversially say that we just need really need some great data and the fantastic people on the call can build the, uh, the stuff that um, is useful because it changes each week. So yeah, we're conducting user research. Okay, great, brilliant. Uh, hopefully we'll, we, we can share this recording with you. It's all on YouTube so you can have it, um, which is amazing. Okay, um, the, if there's no other specific, are there any specific questions for Jenny in that, in that work? Other than it's just brilliant and we, we love it. Um, okay, fantastic. I think you got away with that, Jenny. Uh, that, that, that's good. I think there's quite a lot of people who are playing around with R and, and uh, learning new stuff. So it's, it's um, uh, that, that, that's good to see. Um, the last thing I'd like to make, I'm gonna ask, um, we're, we're gonna try and finish before 12, but uh, Mark Farr's are online. Um, our next session is gonna be hosted uh, by Beautiful Information on the 5th of November. Um, we, we try to avoid half term or if, any, if anyone knows exactly when half term is going to be or whether we're going to get a, a, a circuit breaker or things like that. So we, we try to avoid that two weeks, roughly. We're going to do a, a, the next open date saves lives on the, on the 5th of November. So Mark, would you like to just let people know what we're planning to talk about there? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Paul. Just a couple of really quick points. Um, I think if we did as much work trying to get people to use this data and understand it as as, in as much way as we kind of got the data out and made it available, I think that's a whole other work stream because there's a risk to your question to Jenny about all this fantastic work going on and it not being used as much as it should do. And there's a whole work stream there about how people use this. And, and when we were at Dr. Foster publishing hospital standardized mortality rates in the Sunday papers and trying to get people's heads around data, there's a whole, there's a lot more work to do there. Um, another quick plug on Twitter, we wrote a letter to Matt Hancock and Simon Stevens about the mix up with, Excel and CSV files. So we published a letter from AFA, which is the Association of Professional Healthcare Analysts. So we're going to get them on to Open Data Saves Lives. They want to join in and join the fight as well, which is good. So have a look at that, please, people. Um, and then to Paul's point, what we're going to try each month is a kind of probably two of these. And I would observe that we've come at it from a kind of an, an open data expert view, people like Stuart and Jenny and others. And what we want to do as well, which we've mixed we've mixed in at different places is kind of a health expertise as well. So I'll, I'll lead one each month with his, which is kind of health led. And, and that was hopefully alongside these, which are more tech and data led when, when we hope that that's a kind of marriage made in heaven. Uh, so we're going to do one on the fifth. We're going to talk about healthcare, uh, hospital acquired infection data. Uh, I've got a, a, a murder in, um, investigator uh, doing some work on domestic abuse, which is really interesting. I'd in, really encourage everyone to talk about that. Uh, I've got people lined up to talk about how we do modelling of COVID through the winter and have another look at excess mortality, but kind of from a, a more of a health bent than from a kind of open data bent. And then Paul and I will kind of manage that hopefully beautiful marriage. So 5th of November and watch out for it on Twitter. Thank Thanks you very much. much. Yeah, no, no problem. That's great. Um, and, and as always, if you've got any questions, um, we don't own Open Data Saves Lives. We want as many people to get involved as possible. It, it's, um, it's quite a good brand. People are, are using it and are using it to, to have different conversations with um, more people um, and a little bit more diverse um, uh, ways. And also um, it allows people to um, share when maybe they uh, have been a bit more cautious uh, previously. So uh, please, please do join in. Let ourselves know, let uh, Mark and the Beautiful Information people know if you want to get involved. And um, I said I'm at half, I said I think we're at half time, but I'm a, a natural optimist. So maybe we're not quite at half time, but um, we'll do that. So we've finished before 12. If there's any other points, um, uh, just 
I think, yeah, well, the national data strategy, yes, there's, <laughs> there's, we have lots of little thoughts about that. Um, um, yeah, um, but, we, but uh, we'll be publishing on our website and Jenny's going to be doing the same. So I think if we all join in on that and, and try and make our, our point heard would be, would be amazing. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Um, have a, a, a great rest of the week and we'll all catch up at the next one on the 5th of November. Thank you.